I want to talk about um, parapsychology and ecological self and think about the relationship of um, different fields of research. So in particular, I'm going to be thinking about um, anthropology, deep ecology and parapsychology and think about how it might be that they are all kind of, you know, focusing in on the same phenomenon. So the idea um, for this talk is kind of spun out of a book that I published last year called Green the Paranormal, which is a, kind of like a broad exploration of the links between ecology and anomalistics. And I've taken an anomalistics in quite a broad uh, manner as well. So it includes things like you know, everything from parapsychology to cryptozoology. Religious studies I would include in anomalistics as well. Though I'm sure many religious studies scholars wouldn't like to be included in there. Um, so you know, it takes a broad view of the relationship between ecology and you know the religious, the magical religious, the spiritual, shamanistic, and the paranormal. And there's a whole load of really great contributions in there. So if you are interested in exploring these uh, themes in more depth, then this would be a good place to start. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to get at with this talk a kind of um, Venn diagram where we have these different disciplines on the outside, you know, anthropology, which is my main background, parapsychology, which I've been involved in, you know, writing and thinking about for quite a long time now, and deep ecology, which is something that I came to, to learn about through um, a permaculture project that I was working on. It was actually an educational project about bringing permaculture principles into a secondary school. But throughout that process, I became much more interested in this idea of deep ecology. And we'll talk about this middle section here. This is where we'll end up. And um, it's not included on this slide, but it will be at the end. But the, I think the locus of all of these three fields is this thing called the ecological self. So this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to tell you about. Um, first of all, we're going to think about what is the self. So this is our anthropological um, circle. We'll have a look at a few different anthropological ideas about the, you know, how, how we can define the self. Then we'll think about whether the self is a cultural category or an experiential reality. Now I'll introduce us to the idea of the ecological self and some ideas from uh, deep ecology and eco-psychology, a couple of definitions, before finally turning to think about parapsychology um, and psychical research. And we'll go right back to Frederick Myers and his uh, gothic psychology and see how that actually resembles in a lot of ways some of these ideas about the ecological self that deep ecologists talk about. And finally end up with psi and ecological self and some more recent thought on that. So let's delve in. So anthropology has got a long uh, history of thinking about the self. And most um, kind of, you know, when we're writing histories of these things or doing a literature review, most anthropologists will go back to a really influential paper by Marcel Mauss, who was the um, nephew of the famous sociologist Emile Durkheim. Because he wrote this paper um, about the person, a category of the human mind. And his basic suggestion is that um, the self is a cultural category. And it has evolved, you know, in similar ways to other kinds of cultural things. So he's arguing that, you know, there are kind of, we can trace back different stages in the development of self concepts. So his ideas about the self are really about that the self is essentially a set of beliefs about the nature of the self. So he starts off with the idea of the self as the subject. So this is the idea of, um, you know, we, of us being like an embodied subjective perspective, that we actually experience the world from this point of view. Then he talks about the role. So, you know, he's in these things, he's saying that there's a kind of like an evolutionary process. So we start off as a subject, which could be even, I suppose, like animal selfhood or something like that. Then we, be, we develop roles. Um, so we have particular functions that we perform in society. Then he says we get we end up with this idea of the persona, which is a character that we play in society and also is related to, you know, our status in terms of like um, moral systems and legal systems. And then his final idea is that we eventually emerge with this concept of the Christian person, which is kind of like um, 
a unified individual soul as a kind of like a metaphysical entity. And he, his basic argument, you know, writing early in the 19, in the 1900s, is that this is where Western society is at with this idea of the Christian person. So the Western person, the European person is, a, is the Christian person. So this is the idea then, like I just mentioned, of the person being defined as an individual that is bounded by the limitations of our skin. We're kind of like conceived in this scheme as a psychological being. And you know, this is the kind of the common view in most modern post-industrial Euro-American societies. Okay, but there's other ways of thinking about the self as well. So we jump forward to, to the 90s now. And anthropologist Melford Spiro, he wrote this paper in response to a really influential paper by Marcus and Kitayama, which was an exploration of this idea of the, or a, a comparison of the Western and the non-Western models of the self. And Spiro wrote a great paper, Is the Western Self, um, something like, Is the Western Self Strange in the Context of Other Models of the Self? So he suggests that there are three categories or three different ways that we can think about the self. We can think about it as the psychobiological organism. So again, this idea that, you know, the self is everything that we are up to the limits of our skin and it doesn't extend beyond that. So we are, you know, encapsulated living entities the self could be our own representation of our own person so how we think about ourselves essentially or it could actually be you know some kind of a, a genuine like psychological entity so maybe the self is a soul or an ego or something that exact actually exists within us and all of these different ideas about the self get used in different ways by different anthropologists, by different theorists. And, you know, it leads to a, a kind of, this is what um, Spiro's point was, that it leads to kind of confusion that no one really knows what they're talking about when they're talking about the self. So it could be any of these things. Um, another very influential definition of the self, specifically of the Western individual idea of the self, comes from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz. And his argument was that in the West, our model of the self is a bounded, unique, more or less integrated motivational and cognitive universe. So the idea is that we're like a, a dynamic center of awareness, emotion, judgment and action organized into a distinctive whole. So we are an individual and we set ourselves contrastively against other wholes. So against other people and also against our social and natural background. So in the Western world, the argument is that the, the individual is fully separated or conceives of themselves as fully separated from nature, but also from other individuals. Okay, but you know, this is a cultural model. And um, we know like, as parapsychologists that people have experiences that go, go beyond this cultural model, even within Western contexts. So we'll get to that in a little while. Another way of thinking about this, another anthropologist, Charles Taylor, talks about the Western self as being buffered. You know, so it's like we have a kind of like a, a membrane or a sheath around us that separates us from the world. Okay, but there is also another thing that anthropologists have noticed. So although they have recognized this individual bounded notion of the self that, you know, is perpetuated in western euro-american societies they've also found evidence of what might be called a individual self you know so if, if the individual is a whole that is bounded then the individual self might be made of lots of different parts or it might be conceived as kind of permeable so that there you know that there, there are boundaries but they are fluid boundaries or they're, they're boundaries that things can come in and in and out of so you know for example beliefs about um, spirit possession and, and mediumship and things like that because the, the belief is that the spirit can move into the body you know these represent a kind of a permeable individual kind of way of thinking about the self you know or people who believe that God can communicate with them for example you know through prayer or whatever <laughs> 
this the idea is that you know our self is can be opened up to other influences so in anthropology it was through the work of uh, marilyn strathern an anthropologist uh, that we get this idea or this concept of the individual self and she was writing about um melanesian personhood i think in, in papua new guinea um, and she noticed there that their model of the self was, again, like, in, like I've been saying, very different to this Western individual bounded model. So I've got a little snippet here from another paper that kind of gives a nice little comparison of, of the individual and the individual. Okay, so the individual is considered to be divisible, comprising a complex of separable, interrelated, but essentially independent dimensions or aspects. The individual is thus monadic, while the individual is fractal. The individual is atomistic, while the individual is always socially embedded. The individual is an autonomous social actor, the author of his or her own actions, while the individual is a heteronymous actor performing a culturally written script. And it goes on. And basically the idea is that, you know, in, um, in the individual way of thinking about the self, we are encouraged to be um, individuals separate from everyone else and to, to you know to forge our own path forward whereas in many non-western societies where this individual model of the self is the norm it's more about uh, social um, interaction social cohesion so that the self is never something that exists independently but is actually the culmination of lots of different social uh, social processes interacting you know, so we're part of our families our families are part of wider networks and um, we're part of communities and things like that so that's the idea of the the individual self that it actually is made up of lots of different parts so i've got a few little examples ethnographic examples of different models of non-western selfhood so there's an example from japan what it means to be a person in the japanese sense cannot be understood without reference to the individual social ties the particular, particular, usually tight and limited human nexus to which he or she belongs, from which one derives identity and to which one is totally committed. Okay, uh, Malays on the island of Langkawi become complete persons, that is kin, through living and consuming together in houses. Identity and substance are mutable and fluid. These perceptions suggest a processual view of kinship and personhood. So the idea with this one is that you know people become selves you're not born like with the, the this christian notion of a, of a person as an like an individual soul so that's suddenly incarnated into a body and that is yourself actually what they say is that the self is something that we grow and develop over time it's a process and it can change and be molded by our experience and also obviously is embedded within these kinship networks and again, another example, the concept of Noman, this is in um, Papua New Guinea, I think, um, can be glossed variously as mind, intention, will, agency, social conscience, desire, or personality. It clearly covers a wide range of meanings. meanings. These meanings have to be seen processually in terms of the life cycle and of social interaction. So again, you know, that this concept of the self is a processual concept you know, it's the self develops over time and it's embedded in social networks. So like I pointed out before though, although, you know, we make this distinction between Western and non-Western self, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't find, you know, what we might call non-Western models of the self existing in pockets within Western contexts. So psychologist Lillard makes a good point here. She says, while probably fairly accurate for the majority of people, the majority of the time, this characterization of Euro-American folk psychology uh, certainly has limitations. For example, religious beliefs, e.g. whether non-material sources like spirits or God can directly influence one's mind, are a source of variation within Euro-American culture. But they are rarely considered in discussions of folk psychology. Okay, so variation in folk psychological thinking hasn't received adequate attention from researchers. Um, and this, you know, prompted me to think a, a little bit about this as well uh, when I was doing my research with mediums, because the the mediums uh, that you know when I asked the mediums and sitters at the Bristol Spirit Lodge about how they thought about the self, 
they spoke about it in terms that much more closely resembled the non-Western model of the self than the Western model. So, for example, one of the, uh, the, the circle leaders, she, when I asked her what the self is like, she said the self is kind of like an onion and it has many layers to it that you can, you know, you can move in and out of these different layers. Well, if the self has many layers, then it's a individual model of the self. It has multiple components. Um, and also the idea, obviously, that spirits can possess bodies, um, you know, deliberately through mediumship is evidence of, of, a, of a individual notion of the self as well. So my suggestion then is that the self, rather than being a cultural category, and that's not to say that there aren't cultural models of the self, because obviously there are, but that the actual self is more of an experiential phenomenon. And again, like these other models of the self, it's something that we learn and develop through experience. And this would help us to explain why, you know, in, in the Western context, for example, when we have some kind of experiences like uh, you know, near-death experiences or psychedelic experiences or things like that, that those experiences expand our models of the self and uh, go beyond our cultural models. Okay, so the self itself is actually experiential and we kind of learn and explore it and go to new places within it. But usually we're kind of, we're limited by our cultural model. And these experiences bust that cultural model open. So I think if we think about the self more in terms of experience rather than cultural models, then we might be getting closer to what the self actually is. Uh, and it probably reveals that the self is actually lots and lots of different things to every individual subjective self <laughs> so yeah interesting um that the self then might be something that we learn through experience although we are given a cultural model our experiences can break through that and go to different to new places and that's what happens with the mediums so their model of the self isn't the classic western bounded self because of the experiences they've had it's a more kind of individual um expanded notion of the self so this is where I want to start to think about the ecological self. So this is one of the other circles on our Venn diagram of deep ecology. So Arnie Ness is um, widely regarded as the founder of the deep ecology movement. And he started writing, um, he was, you know, an, a, like a mainstream kind of analytical philosopher. Um, and in the 60s and 70s, he started to think about um, environmental ethics. And the deep, deep ecology movement came out of a paper that he wrote where he made a contrast between, on the one hand, shallow ecology, which is the idea that, you know, we can um, we can save the planet by switching, converting to electric cars, uh, you know, doing recycling and all of those kind of things, but essentially maintaining our normal Western lifestyle. Or we can go down the deep ecology route, which is actually a total transformation of our underlying you know philosophical frameworks and everything for you know a, a total re reshifting of our um sense of connection to everything else so the deep ecology movement then is more than just you know changing light bulbs and getting electric cars it's a a ra much more radical kind of shift and um the ultimate goal kind of of this shift in perspective is self-realization, uh, you know, to find out who we truly are. And um, Arnie Ness suggests that through this process of self-realization, we kind of gradually move away from um, our egoic, bounded individual, you know, Western conceptions of the self towards what he calls the ecological self. And the way that we do that, this you know to move towards the ecological self is through engagement and participation with our local environments there's a great film that you can watch of arnie ness um, explaining you know deep ecology but from his little mountain hut in norway it's called um i can't remember what it's called something to do with a mountain you, you'll probably be able to find it on youtube but it's i recommend it so the ecological self then emerges out of participation and interaction with our local environments uh, but he doesn't give us any kind of explicit definition of the ecological self. Um, you know, it, it, we can't. He, he's saying that the ecological self is more like, more like a process than a definition. But he does say that the ecological self of a person um, is that with which this person um, identifies. 
So it's the thing that we, he's saying that the ecological self is what we essentially identify with. So, you know, we can identify elements external to our physical bodies, the environment, for example, as an extension or a part of our self. This is the idea of the ecological self, that it extends out. Okay, so he's saying that um, this key sentence, rather than a definition about the self, shifts the burden of clarification from the term self to that of identification, or rather the process of identification. So again, is moving it away from, you know, we don't want to define the self in terms of a cultural category. What we really want to define the self as, or the ecological self, is a genuine, like the genuine way that we perceive our relationship with the environment. And it's interconnected with the environment. Okay, so the, the ecological self then, from Ness's perspective, emerges when we come to identify the environment with ourselves to the extent that we realize that actually. You know, when we are preserving ecosystems and habitats and, you know, all of these things that we need to do, we're also performing an act of self-preservation. So it's breaking down the distinction between the individual uh, or the person or the human person and the, the non-human world, essentially. Um, another perspective on the ecological self comes from the philosopher Freya Matthews. Okay, so she describes a holistic nesting of a self in a wider self system. Okay, so the idea is that, you know, the self is, is one part of much wider networks of different things. Um, and this means that the self is actually, you know, you can't separate the self from this wider, wider self, uh, wider system. Because the self stands in relations of ecological interdependence, direct or indirect, with the elements of that wider self, those elements or its relations to them are logically involved in its identity. So all of the things that we relate to in the environment are also a part of our identity. Individuality in this framework is thus a relative matter. It is a function of involvement in a wider system, the identity of which is implicated in the identities of each of its participant subsystems. The individual is thus in a very real sense a microcosm, microcosm of the wider I can't see what that says. System. So, um, yeah, another way of thinking about the, the ecological self as embedded within these, you know, nested systems. And then the final um, model of the ecological self I want to mention is from Joanna Macy, the eco psychologist. And again, she's talking about the ecological self as a sense of interconnectedness. She says, once we tune into our interconnectedness, responsibility towards self and other become indistinguishable. So again, it's about a breakdown between the self and the other, because each thought and act affects the doer as much as the one done to. Just as an amputee continues to feel twinges in the severed limb, so in a sense do we experience in anguish for homeless people or hunted whales, pain that belongs to a separated part of our body, a larger body than we thought we had, Unbound, unbounded by our skin. Okay, so this ecological self then that people like Arnie Ness, um, Joanna Macy and Freya Matthews are talking about sounds very similar to this individual non-Western model of the self that anthropologists have been talking about. Okay, so we're starting to see a kind of like a, a blending here of fields. So now we enter into the third um, circle of a Venn diagram, which is psychical research and parapsychology. So I was giving this a similar talk to um, my MA students the other days, and I had I gave them a, a, a quick introduction to parapsychology, but you guys probably know most of it already, so I'll just go through it quite quickly. But you know, the Society for Psychical Research was established in 1882 in uh, Cambridge. So we've had, you know, since 1882, at least, uh, that long of concerted research into these things. And as you know, it was the first organization in the world to adopt a scientific approach to that large group of debatable phenomena designated by such terms as mesmeric, psychical, and spiritualistic. But in, in the 1930s, we also know that psychical research becomes parapsychology as we know it today, more or less, and it becomes increasingly uh, laboratory-based and statistical. I think in part this is you know to do with the influence of things like behaviorism and all of that kind of stuff in the 1920s and 
parapsychology wanting to make itself appear to be a, a rigorous science and everything, which is all good. Um, and it was, you know, it was basically a shift in research methods. So where previously psychical researchers had been field-based researchers, parapsychology now becomes a laboratory-based discipline. And actually, I think that this shift to a laboratory-based discipline has detracted slightly, although good data has come out of it, but it's detracted slightly from understanding these phenomena in their, uh, in their natural contexts. So, you know, all of my other research in anthropology and things has been about how parapsychologists in this, through this process have ignored the, the social and cultural context of the paranormal you know, and the, the kind of like emotional and um, all of those kind of things, factors that lead to these experiences. Well, the same is true of, you know, the ecological context as well. So in moving away from a field based approach, you know, going out to investigate haunted houses and things like that. Um, and moving into the lab, we have again totally separated psi phenomena from their wider interconnected systems that they're obviously a part of. So, you know, there's interesting potential for expanding parapsychological research methods to incorporate this broader, you know, the social, social cultural context, but also the ecological context as well, which I think would be interesting. And you all know that the PA was admitted to the American Academy of Sciences in 1969. And as a little interesting nugget associated with anthropology, it was Margaret Mead who gave it a good push. And, you know, parapsychological research continues to produce challenging data, as you all know. I want to go back to look at Frederick Myers now. So go right back to the very beginning of, paras of yeah, well, parapsychology, psychical research because some of his ideas about the self, um, really pioneering ideas, obviously, um, but they resemble this ecological self that we've been talking about and this mod, this individual self that anthropologists have been talking about. So it's almost like he was onto something <laughs> early on. So we know Myers, um, he's a hero for many people. And he was a founding member of the Society for Psychical Research. Uh, he was, um, you know, a, a classicist and a poet as well. So he, he was coming from a quite a different angle, but he was really influential in the early days of, you know, psychology before psychology really is formalized. And he was interested in all aspects of psychical research. He wrote about apparitions, mediumship, and obviously lots about human survival after death. And after his death, um, his book was published, uh, Human Personality and Survival of Bodily Death, which is his kind of like magnum opus. Um, but it's interesting, the model of the self that Myers came up with is a very complicated model of the self. Or I should actually say complex model rather than complicated. So he's not saying that, this, that, that consciousness or that the mind or self or any of those kind of things are simple but they're actually very complex. Okay, so William James actually referred to Myers' model of psychology as a Gothic psychology, and I really like that. I like the idea of a Gothic psychology. You can imagine it um, in my mind. Um, because, precisely because it's complex and it's multidimensional. Okay, but actually Myers didn't refer to it as a Gothic psychology, he called it a multiplex psychology. And that's also a cool term. So either way is good. There's some, you know, this is a, goth, a piece of Gothic architecture. You can see it's like fractals. It's complicated, no, complex, sorry. Um, so in an obituary published in the Proceedings of the SPR, James wrote about all about Myers and his, his approach. And he was, you know, giving him praise and all these kinds of things. But this is the interesting quote that I drew, drew from it. And he's talking about this romantic approach to psychology. Their work is like going from classic to Gothic architecture, where few outlines are pure and where uncouth forms lurk in the shadows. A mass of mental phenomena are now seen in the shrubbery beyond the parapet. Fantastic, ignoble, hardly human, or frankly non-human. And just pause there because this reference, you know, James is talking here about the non-human, the non-human parts of the self, 
well, this is really, you know, even today, <laughs> cutting edge thinking about the self. The non-human turn in anthropology, for instance, you know, is like a 20, 2016 <laughs> phenomenon. But I think James was ahead of the curve, as usual. Um, yeah, so fantastic, ignoble, hardly human, or frankly non-human are some of these new candidates for psychological description. The world of the mind is shown as something infinitely more complex than was suspected, and whatever beauties it may still possess, it has lost at any rate the beauty of academic neatness. But despite the triumph of romanticism, psychologists, as, as a rule, have still some lingering prejudices against the noblest and, um, I can't see what that says, in favour of the nobler simplicities. So basically he's saying, Myers presents this wonderful, complex view of the of consciousness of the self, but psychology tends towards reductionism anyway, so it's not going to go anywhere, basically. Okay, but the, the really interesting thing about, well, one of the interesting things about Myers is his is his realization of the, at least a dual nature of consciousness okay and we're probably all familiar with these ideas but you know many people aren't and in you know like um introductions to ecological psychology i don't think many people go back to to myers but i think that there's a case to be made for going back as far as myers anyway he says that there are two strands of consciousness the supraliminal which is our waking awareness you know, above the threshold of consciousness, the things that we experience. And then there's the subliminal, which is all of those things that go on below the threshold of our awareness and that, that bubble up occasionally in the form of dreams or through altered states of consciousness, we can make contact with these things. Um, and his argument is that this, this, con this idea of the subliminal mind kind of bubbling up into, into supraliminal consciousness uh, could help us to understand for lots of different kinds of uh, paranormal experiences and mystical experiences and those kind of things. And obviously, uh, he was writing before Freud and Jung, so he had a big influence on them in their models of the unconscious mind, which is essentially the subliminal mind. Okay, so this is what he, um, this is how Myers explains his concept of the multiplex self in um, survival of human personality. And it sounds to me, again, a lot like the ecological self and the non-Western model of the self. So he says, the conscious self of each of us, as we call it, the empirical, the supraliminal self, does not comprise the whole of the consciousness within us. There exists a far more comprehensive consciousness, a profounder faculty, which for the most part remains potential, only so far as regards the life of earth, but from which the consciousness and the faculty of earth life are mere selections. So it's interesting also that he's bringing in this discussion of earth life and you know, understanding that consciousness is, has evolved in the context of all of these other living things. So he goes on, I regard each man as at once, or woman we should say, I regard each man as at once profoundly unitary and almost infinitely composite as inheriting from earthly ancestors a multiplex and colonial organism, polyzoic and perhaps polypsychic in an extreme degree, but also as ruling and unifying that organism by a soul or spirit absolutely beyond our present analysis, a soul which has originated in a spiritual or metatherical um, environment. So again, this idea of the multiplex self as a colonial organism consisting of lots of different parts, polyzoic, great words, and polypsychic in an extreme degree, sounds like the ecological self. You know, if the ecological self is the things that we, is our ability to identify with things that are not ourselves, then I think that would count as polyzoic and polypsychic. Okay, so just to go on, he says, I mean no unreal opposition or forced divorcement of sacred and secular, of flesh and spirit, as our link with other spirits strengthens, as the life of the organism pours more fully through the individual cell, we shall feel love more ardent, uh, wider wisdom, higher joy, perceiving that this organic unity of soul, which forms the inward aspect of the telepathic law, is in itself the order of the cosmos, the summation of things. So actually, he's suggesting that this telepathic principle that, you know, we, we get the idea of telepathy from Myers, that this telepathic principle is actually the thing that connects 
all of these different orders of the cosmos. It's like the, the threads that run through the network. Okay, so more recent anthrop not anthropologists, so parapsychologists have also commented on these ideas. William Browder is a good example. Um, he says, Psi events suggest that these limited identities may be quirks of an unnecessarily limited and habituated attention, self-perception and self-conception. So that would be, you know, the cultural models of the self. Such an individual self-concept may be to a large extent culturally conditioned, because even without considering Psi events, we can find in other cultures greater identifications with others, with one's extended family, one's community, one's ancestors, with aspects of the natural world. Even within a Western Eurocentric culture, we experience expansions of self-identity beyond their usual bounds in certain non-ordinary conditions of consciousness. Psi experiences suggest even further and more profoundly, um, more profound extensions of identity. Okay, so the Psi phenomena that we observe appear to require and to reveal this interconnectedness. This connectedness seems more subtle, more extensive, and more profound. Um, are more profound than other more familiar conventional forms of consciousness and experience. Okay, so again, this idea that parapsychology might actually all along have been investigating the ecological self, you know, going right the way back to uh, Myers, even though they weren't necessarily thinking of it in those terms, the thing that they were documenting and describing with their experiments is actually the, uh, the ecological self. And it's nice to see that other eco-psychologists, I mean, it's not necessarily um, a mainstream perspective within eco-psychology, I don't think, but there are transpersonal eco-psychologists, and there are some who have suggested that, um, you know, psi needs to be brought into eco-psychological thinking. So Kerr and Kia are a good example, and they argue that the human psyche is woven into nature in the same way that psi is interwoven into a larger emotional context. Okay, so that we are like embedded within these systems. So I'll just summarize then quickly. So we can see from this that, you know, anthropologists have recognized that there are different models of the self, and these have generally been thought of as cultural models, but actually, um, they might better be thought of in terms of experience. Um, so, you know, you might be brought up with an individual model of the self, but then you have a certain experience that expands that, and all of a sudden you have a individual model of the self, or at least an expanded model. So it doesn't mean that you're not going to find individual selfhood in Western contexts. Um, for example, in subcultures, uh, with things like mediumship development and religious practices and those kind of things. Okay, so yeah, the self might be experiential rather than social. And uh, psychological, psychical researchers and parapsychologists have been investigating individual forms of the self in Western contexts for 150 years or more. So there's a whole wealth of interesting research on individual models of the self that does include psi and the paranormal that, you know, eco-psychology could be drawing on. Uh, Myers' multiplex self sounds very similar to some of the models of the ecological self discussed by eco-psychologists. Psi data implies that we are connected via invisible networks and supports the view of an interconnected cosmos. So, you know, the overarching question is, have parapsychologists been researching the ecological self all along? And if this is the case, then it might help us to understand some of the, like, the major and quite puzzling effects of many different kinds of paranormal experiences. So, you know, from alien abductions through to near-death experiences, one of the most commonly reported effects is a sense of greater connection to the cosmos. So it could be that in those situations, we are, you know, our ecological self is kicking in <laughs> and we, our, per, our boundaries become more permeable and we, we are opening ourselves up to an expanded ecological perspective. So there we go, just a few thoughts. Um, so there we go, the ecological self then, this thing that we've been talking about exists you know, at the juncture of these three different fields. Um, and you could probably add other circles in there as well, for sure. And there's some references. So there we go.